Good afternoon. I'll say it one more time. Um, we're going to have a great conversation here, and we're going to try and squeeze it into 20 minutes, which is difficult. Um, so the topic, of course, defense tech, the renaissance of defense tech. And, and when they asked me to moderate this, the first thing I thought of was an old professor of mine, Ash Carter, former uh, Secretary of Defense in the United States. And back in 2015, he created the Defense in Innovation Unit mm -hmm. with the objective of essentially recognizing that defense was changing and the Defense Department, this big bureaucracy, was going to actually have to work with the, the tech sector to actually innovate and effect change and be on the front foot. That was eight years ago. And I think the world has been transformed and the defense tech space has been transformed during those eight years. So what I'm going to ask my two speakers to talk a little bit about is what's going to happen in the next eight years? Where's it going? Um, where is defense tech going? What do we need? What platforms do we need? What's working? What isn't working? Uh, and how do companies and governments take advantage of the opportunity? We have two phenomenal speakers to talk to us about this. On my immediate left, Trey Stevens, co-founder and exec chair of Anduril. Yeah, close enough. Industries, a defense tech company, but also um, a partner at the VC company Founders Fund, where he invests not just in defense tech, but more broadly than that. And on Trey's left is Michael, help me, I'm going to absolutely massacre your name. Kratzios. Kratzios? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Close enough, yeah. Michael, who's the MD of Scale AI, the former chief technology officer in the White House, and the acting undersecretary of defense for research and engineering. So thank you both for joining us. So let me start with a really broad question to the both of you. Maybe I'll start with you, Trey. How do you see global security dynamics changing over, I said, the next eight years? Right. So how is it going to change over the next eight years? I think there's quite a lot there. Okay. Um, first off, I think Ash Carter kind of spearheaded a lot of the changes that have, we've been seeing happening over the last eight years. Um, you know, he not, he not only started the Defense Innovation Unit, but he also launched the Third Offset Initiative at, uh, at the Pentagon. He also brought the Defense Digital Service into the building, which was an outcropping of the United States Digital Service. Um, he, he, his legacy is tremendously impactful in the building. Um, you know, a lot of what's happening on the defense uh, technology side of the world can be seen reflected in geopolitical conflicts that are active uh, globally right now. You, you see conflicts like Armenia and Azerbaijan or, or what's going on in Ukraine um, where kind of the, the way that we approach these conflicts historically um, with big, exquisite, expensive defense systems, you know, aircraft carriers, fighter planes um, are becoming much less relevant um, with the advent of low-cost uh, drones uh, and mass that's coming from our adversaries. So the real question is about how you get to affordable mass on the part of the defender um, to prevent the, the, your adversary from basically bleeding you dry. And I'll give you an example. Uh, an Iranian Shahed drone is uh, priced out at somewhere between $100,000 and $150,000 a pop. These are suicide drones. Um, at cost to the United States, a uh, Patriot missile is two and a quarter million dollars. To our partner nations, they're closer to like four million dollars. So every time you have a $150,000 drone flying into your airspace, and you're shooting it down with a $4 million missile. It's a really bad trade-off. And so a lot of what we're focused on at Anduril is trying to figure out ways to leverage the enhancements that have happened in software, applied artificial intelligence, computer vision, next generation command and control, um, to dramatically bring down the cost of, of defending and creating a deterrent impact without having to rely on these expensive, exquisite systems. So I just want to come back to you quickly and then I'll come to you, Michael. Um, you know, you brought up some of the geopolitical conflicts taking place in the world. And if I look at Ukraine, there's a lot of use of commercial technology. So how as a defense tech company, are you making sure you're not squeezed on the one hand with the big behemoth defense and the commercial technology coming in and stepping in and taking your paycheck? Yeah, I, I, for what it's worth, I wouldn't view it as taking our paycheck. Okay. 
um, a lot of the usage of commercial technologies that you've seen in, in the conflict in Ukraine has been uh, by necessity given the electronic warfare capabilities of Russia. So, uh, you know, they have a very robust capability around GPS denial, uh, radio takeover, all sorts of stuff that is affecting your an ability to control airspace. And so the Ukrainian response to that without having robust systems to counter that has been to fly very inexpensive drones to do um, you know, very small munitions delivery, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance missions. Um, and, and they're doing that because it's not a big deal to lose a $1,000 drone. Yeah. It's a yeah. very big deal to lose a $1 million drone. Yeah. And so what we've been focused on at Anderil, uh in the conflict in Ukraine is delivering capabilities to them that are military grade, that are resilient to the electronic warfare threats that the Russians are posing. Um, and those will get used for much more tactical, high priority missions. Uh, and then the things that they don't want to risk losing more expensive tactical assets to, the commercial drones are probably a better option anyway. Okay. So I want to come back to you in a second to talk a little bit about kind of segmenting the market and, and how you see that yeah. over the next kind of five, eight years. But Michael, I want to come to you and I want to ask a similar question that I asked Trey, but specifically focusing on AI. And so how is AI and some of the things that we're seeing in the commercial side, but how's that playing out in the defense tech space? And again, I wanted to ask you, let's look forward. What does the next five, eight years look like? Where do you think we'll be? Yeah, it's a great question. I think on the artificial intelligence front, what we're seeing is a lot of, a lot of our adversaries are uh, very quickly being able to adopt AI-powered, low-cost technologies. And We've seen public reporting of sort of these swarm-related technologies that the, uh, that the Chinese have been able to field. In that sense, those are things that could, that could put a lot of our, again, exquisite, exquisite, very expensive U.S. assets at risk in the airspace. Um, so generally, it goes back to a, a thesis that Scale has always had for a very long time, which is that data is the ammunition for the future AI warfare. And what we always try to express to the U.S. government and the governments across the world and our allies that are trying to figure out how to cope with this new reality is you must ensure that your data assets are in place because there's no way that you can actually build very robust AI systems to both be on offense and on defense without having your data in line. And that's what we spend a lot of time helping the U.S. government with and a lot of our partners and allies. So I just want to pick up, I mean, that's a, such an imp important, interesting point. And I'm going to quote, Data is the ammunition for the future of warfare. So where does that take us in eight years? What does that look like? Paint a picture for us. I think that means that both the US and all of our allies have to be very serious about uh, working on and improving their data pipelines. All the amazing technologies that companies like Andrew built can't succeed unless they're fed high quality data that allows them to do their targeting correctly, allows them to analyze what's going on with the adversary. All of it is dependent on a data layer and a foundation that um, has to be prioritized in DOD. And I will say, you know, we've seen some progress over the last few years with, uh, with some centralized groups within the Pentagon making it a priority and trying, uh, and trying to see it through to the end, but there's still a lot of work to be done. What is the one misconception for the people sitting here, what is the thing that they're missing or that they think is going to take us 10 years and is going to take us two for both of you? Like, what is the, what is the one thing that you know that they don't know? Yeah. Um, I tend to be probably slightly more paranoid. Okay. Um, and most of my answers to this question would operate in reverse. Okay. I think a lot of times people assume that things move a lot faster than they do. And okay. so I think it's more likely that the things that we all might be worried could happen in two years won't happen until 10, ten, ten years. years. Okay. Um, the, the whole idea of like fully autonomous warfare with Terminator, killer robots, is comical to the point of yeah. ridiculousness. Like, okay. not only are we not close to being able to deliver like, technical capabilities to do that, but also, like, the law is very clear about how to engage with lethality and human-in-the-loop accountability and things like that. And, uh, and so I think if you look at the conflict in Ukraine as a proxy for this question, what are the core capabilities that are being used there mm -hmm. that, that the United States has provided in particular? Stingers, Javelins, Gimlers, Patriots, Abrams tanks. Literally all of these things are built in the Cold War. Yeah. 
And so I think the reality is, is like, everyone has a crazy uncle um, that you sit around the table at Thanksgiving that will tell you all sorts of ridiculous things they believe to be true about the world. My crazy uncle thinks there's like bunkers all over the United States filled with extraterrestrial technology that gives us an a undefeatable advantage in, in international conflict. And that's just like, it's just wrong. And you're here to tell We're him operating well. with Cold War era technology yeah. in yeah. modern conflicts. Yeah. Um, and unless the US government and our allies and partners come together to really push the envelope on breaking free from these old paradigms, my expectation that is in two years, nothing will be nothing different. Nothing will change. Okay, so it's going to go slower than you think. Michael, I want to come back to you. You can answer that, but I actually have a slightly yeah. different question because when I gave you the introduction, you've worked at DOD, yeah. you've worked at the White House. If you had, I mean, there's a lot of people here from government as well as the private sector. If you had one request for government, what would it be? What would you be asking them to do differently? What is holding you back? What is holding us back? Yeah, I, I think there's I have lots of things I could say. I think it's actually one that uh, okay, Trey has a limited actually amount of money written uh, time, extensively so. about. And I think <laughs> the, the problem that I think the DOD has is they're engaged in what, what many people define as innovation theater, where they're required by law to spend a lot of money on small businesses in the United States to the tune of billions of dollars a year. And in doing so, they end up spreading small amounts of money to a wide variety of firms that end up spending years kind of working on these, on these small projects and the pathway to actually turning those into sort of full-scale platforms that the government can use for years to come rarely, rarely happens. So, you know, in the, in the macro picture of can you do procurement reform, I think the biggest thing that we can think about is being um, not so risk-averse on the DOD front, willing to, to write bigger checks to a smaller number of people. And if a couple of them don't work, but a couple do work, that will make a huge, huge difference to progress of innovation in the, in the general defense ecosystem. So you brought up risk, and I have to, so I was mentioning earlier, I had the fortune of interviewing Elon Musk last year. One of the most interesting things from that conversation was how he perceived risk. Hmm. And from his perspective, if something was important enough, it was, ris it was too risky not to do. Now that's a really different attitude towards, say, the financial sector, which goes, and governments, which go, oh my God, if it's risky, I can't touch it. Yeah. I'll live with the status quo. So tell me a little bit about how you both see risk yeah. and how you see risk as entrepreneurs. Well, I, I think it's core to everything that, that changes the world. Okay. Um, the, the misnomer that I think a lot of people in the US government believe is they'll say that the reason that we're falling behind in defense procurement is because the procurement officers and decision makers are risk averse. I actually don't think there's anything more risky for the defense community than hiring Lockheed Martin to build software. That's like, <laughs> that is the riskiest thing you could possibly do. It will fail. Okay. If you look at all of the high profile failures of the last 20 years, things like Boeing Starship program, the 737 MAX, the most recent accident or the crash for the F-35s, these were all software problems that we hired the primes to do. And so if you are truly risk averse, you should hire people that actually know how to build software okay. to solve software problems. Um, and so this is like, the, the word doesn't really get the same meaning that people yeah. I think attach to it. Uh, Elon's perspective on risk I think is absolutely right. Um, if you look at the, the, a different Starship, if you look at SpaceX uh, yeah. last failed Starship launch, I think you got a sense for where these divisions lie between people in the tech community and people in the government. People in the tech community saw the explosion and they were like, this is the coolest RUD, rapid unscheduled disassembly I've ever seen. We're gonna learn so much from yeah, this. There's yeah. like all this data that we're getting from the, the, you know, how the engines performed and how the aerodynamic stability was working. And that's going to take us a leap forward. The government people and the media, if I'm being honest, were like Elon's failed launch uh, highlights like all the risks that's present in space launch. It's like, you don't get to Mars yeah. by ensuring that you have 99.9 .9 repeating reliability on rocket engines. You just, you have to launch. And, uh, and I think this is kind of uh, the, the farce of the whole thing is that ULA, the uh, consortium of Lockheed, Boeing, and Northrop Grumman that was responsible for all of the ISIS resupply launches yeah. and things like that, um, they're basically failing as a business. They have 100% reliability 
They never have a, a launch failure, but they're terrible. They never do anything. It's so expensive. Yeah. They don't do anything. Okay. They're not pushing the edge. Like that's that's the riskiest thing so, you can do. So what you? So I go ahead. No, and I think just to add on that. I say if you through the lens of AI, I think it's it's more risky if we don't try to deploy these technologies because yeah. the, 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 the benefits that they can provide for our warfighters to minimize the types of damage that we don't want to have and so on, I think this could be a, a transformational technology and if we sit back and wait for have sort of triple nines accuracy on these AI algorithms, we're never going to actually have them deployed and our adversaries certainly will be deploying them. So, so it's something we always need to remember. So, so I mean, it sounds to me that both of you, so maybe there's a trend here of the tech space Risk is in not doing rather than in doing. You know, and what you're talking about, Trey, is, I mean, this is like standard management textbook stuff. Like, a failure is the next step to success. Like, you learn from it rather than it being a negative. So let me ask one more. I know we're going to run out of time, but let me ask one other question. You be, you're both Americans. We've been talking about the U.S. government and the failures and successes of the U.S. government, but we're sitting in Riyadh. So... What would your message be? Um, and actually, maybe, I don't know, so let me ask two questions. Let me start with you, Michael. What would your message be to governments here? What do they need to do differently to deliver on the kind of innovation and change that the companies that you're running are putting out there? And then, Trey, I want to come to you, so you're going to get two minutes to think about this. What is the one message that you would say to the people in this room who are running, leading, working in defense tech, innovation, startups. What would you say to them is this is what you need to do to get the foundation in place so that you can be the next Trey Stevens? Okay, Michael, you Yeah, I think on the government side, I mentioned a little bit earlier, my one piece of advice always is you must spend the time, effort, energy, and money to improve your data layer. Because every type of new technological platform that amazing companies like Android are building rely on that to succeed. And you can't ever get to the next level unless you're able to do that. Whether it's through processing satellite imagery or anything else, you have to be able to sort of have that data in line first. So for anyone in the region who's thinking about these transformations in the defense space, you know, I believe that the first core step is doing sort of your, your data layer uh, improvement, and that's something that we work on a lot. Fantastic. Trey. You know, I, when we started Android in 2017, um, we started it because I didn't believe that there were companies that were worth investing in, mm -hmm. in the defense technology space. Um, and then I had like this four or five year period where I thought, there's hope. Like, it's changing. Uh, th we're starting to invest in these capabilities. We're seeing some limited trans transitions into production. Um, our international partners are taking it more seriously. The Europeans increased defense funding. Uh, Japanese increased defense funding. I'm kind of like coming back to the okay. original perspective and this isn't a positive thing. I'm not saying like, woohoo, Andrew's so great. It's more that like, I'm not sure there are a ton of opportunities here. Um, I think that the governments are like baselined into this decision making process that they're just going to give the most of the money to Lockheed Martin and Northrop and Boeing. That's just what they're going to do. Um, and uh, it's very, very hard to make a business like this work, which is why uh, in the like pure defense space, if you think about like Palantir, SpaceX, and Android as like the three big success stories in the last 30 years, all three of them were founded by billionaires. Mm -hmm. That's like that's not a good thing. Like we should have an entrepreneurial ecosystem where you don't have to be a billionaire to start a successful company. Um, but that's a, that is a risk yeah. for the U.S. our partners and allies. I think the thing that I would say to an aspiring entrepreneur in this space, first and foremost is that this sector is not the field of dreams. Okay. If you build it, the government will, will not, not come. come. They okay. will not come. And so you have to figure out how you're going to convince the distribution side of your company to work without just relying on product-led sales, okay. which this is not a sector that you can do product-led sales. No. Okay, with that, um, we're being yanked off. Um, I feel like we've just started the conversation. I took away we need to, we and governments in particular, need to rethink risk. Like fundamentally, we need to reframe how we see risk because we are getting it wrong. Um, and you have to think about dual use because if you're thinking purely in the defense space, it's gonna be a long and rocky road. It's a long and rocky road. Long and rocky road. Okay, thank you, Trey, Michael, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you all for joining us.